Up next in the broadcast, nearly nine billion U.S. dollars will be added to the Korean economy in a newly announced stimulus plan amid worrisome slumps in domestic demand and worsening unemployment among the nation's youth. The Bank of Korea says it will take a closer look at the pace of rate hikes by the U.S. Fed rather than the start date as the BOK expects a continuous rise once the U.S. Central Bank gets started. And in another sign that the U.S. is keen to deploy its THAAD system on Korean soil, America's top military general says South Korea and the U.S. need a layered ballistic missile defense capability. China is expected to repeat its opposition tomorrow. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News. Live from Seoul, I am Kang Tiri. And I'm Sean Lim. Hope you had a great week and thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with another hint that the U.S. wants to deploy an advanced missile defense system in South Korea, much to the chagrin of China. The word out of Washington is that the top U.S. military general in South Korea has called for a layered missile defense capability in the South. Kim Hyun bin has our top story. The commander of U.S. Forces Korea is calling on Seoul and Washington to implement a layered ballistic missile defense capability, and another strong signal that the U.S. is keen to deploy the THAAD system to the Korean Peninsula. In a written testimony to the U.S. House Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense on Thursday, General Curtis Gupparati stressed the need for a ballistic missile defense capability in South Korea due to the threat posed by North Korea. On the same day, an official from the U.S. Defense Department said Washington is prepared to hold official talks with Seoul about the possible deployment of THAAD as there have been no formal consultations thus far. The ongoing speculation about the possible deployment of THAAD to South Korea has stirred controversy inside and outside of Korea. China and Russia are deeply opposed to THAAD being on their regional doorstep, saying it would infringe upon their national security. On the other hand, its supporters say that will counter North Korea's increasing ballistic and missile threats. The U.S. also believes the threat posed by North Korea has become even more acute. Skipperati says that Pyongyang has the ability to produce a miniaturized nuclear warhead that can be mounted on top of a ballistic missile. North Korea has conducted three nuclear bomb tests, the first in 2006, the second in 2009, and the most recent coming in February 2013. Experts predict the potential fourth testing will be to test a miniaturized warhead. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, the possible deployment of THAAD is widely expected to hijack the first foreign ministers meeting in three years between South Korea, China, and Japan this weekend. Our Hwang Sung-hee has a preview. When the top diplomats from Korea, China, and Japan meet on Saturday, they'll discuss ways to restore trilateral cooperation amid strained relations. Tangled in territorial and historical disputes, the talks in Seoul are the first such meeting since 2012. Korea, as the current rotating chair, has been pushing for a gathering of the top diplomats since late last year. But Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi may have another agenda in mind. Since the visit to Korea by Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wan Chan, China has been very vocal about its position on THAAD. It is highly likely that the issue will be brought up again. Korean Foreign Minister Yun byung se will hold separate meetings with the visiting diplomats ahead of the trilateral talks, giving the Chinese minister an opportunity to reiterate Beijing's concerns. On Monday, a senior Chinese diplomat called on Korea to consider Beijing's concerns before deploying the U.S. missile defense system. Seoul says its decision will be based on national interests. There are also questions about whether Korea and Japan will make progress on the issue of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women, especially since this is Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida's first trip to Seoul since taking office in 2012. The visiting ministers are also scheduled to meet with President Park Geun-hye ahead of the trilateral meeting. While Seoul and Tokyo have expressed hopes that Saturday's talks will lead to a trilateral summit, experts say that Beijing will likely remain cautious and make sure that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe apologizes for Japan's wartime atrocities before setting a date. 
Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. On a related note, Beijing's foreign ministry says that the three countries do indeed plan on discussing the prospect of a trilateral summit. The ministry spokesperson, however, added that the right political environment should be established first, noting that historical differences among the three parties is what caused the impasse. Turning to inter-Korean ties, South Korea warms up to the idea of raising wages for North Korean workers at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex. Seoul's Unification Ministry said Friday it's willing to increase wages within the 5% range in line with labor regulations for the complex. Last month, Pyongyang unilaterally decided to hike the minimum wage by more than 5% to 74 U.S. dollars per month starting in March. March payments will be given out from April. April 10th. The Korean government has announced a set of supplementary stimulus measures today, totaling 10 trillion won, which is roughly about 9 billion U.S. dollars. With the country's lending rate at an all-time low, Seoul is aiming to carry out its expansionary policies to spur both consumption and investments. Our Cheo explains. With concerns of deflation on the rise, the government says it will spend an additional 3 trillion won or 2.5 billion U.S. dollars in the first half of this year to speed up economic recovery. At an economy minister's meeting, Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan laid out Seoul's plan to use 2 trillion won from the budget before the end of June and to inject another 1 trillion won or close to 1 billion dollars by pulling funds from its 40 billion dollar stimulus package. The minister also talked about expanding public and private sector investments by 6 billion dollars this year. Friday's measures come just three months after the government's stimulus package amid prolonged weak consumption and an unsteady rise in corporate investments. Growth in consumer prices stayed in the 0% range for a third straight month in February, and businesses cut down more than 7% of facility investments in January. We need to do more to revitalize the economy to supplement the lack of effective demand. Analysts say the government's expansionary measures, coupled with the central bank's record low interest rate, could improve consumer and corporate sentiments. The finance minister also raised concerns about the rising unemployment rate among Korea's young people, which jumped to 11 percent last month. Che added the government, along with the country's labor and management, must compromise on structural reforms. The tripartite commission must reach a high-level agreement by the end of March with an aim to assist the country's young job seekers. Following up on President Buck's recent Middle East tour, the minister asked officials to create a plan by the end of June to support young people find work in overseas health care, IT and cultural sectors. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Following the U.S. Federal Reserve's monetary meeting this week, the Bank of Korea chief says external economic uncertainties may have grown. Ari Shin Semin explains. The U.S. Federal Reserve dovish tone may not be all good news. That's how Korea's central bank is reading the biggest market dictating news this week. Speaking to local bankers on Friday, Bank of Korea Governor Lee Ji-yeol said that Fed's move, which leaves the timing and the pace of a U.S. rate hike open, actually increases uncertainty for Korea's policymakers. The Fed dropped the word patient in its approach, but added that a future rate hike will come only when it's convened of a stronger recovery on the jobs and inflation fronts. The BOK chief's latest comments reflects concerns that global financial markets may show a greater level of volatility, dictated by every economic data point out of the United States. However, market consensus for now seems to be that Korea will likely keep its expansionary policies, especially given the Fed's hint at a gradual hike to its key rate. Last week, the BOK cut Korea's interest rate to a historic low of 1.75 percent. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. 
Would bigger paychecks help economies around the world battle slowing growth and low inflation? Well, that's the path many developed economies are taking as more companies are raising wages. But what about Korea? Our Song Ji-san reports on how Korean workers may have to wait. Korea's minimum wage stands at just below five U.S. dollars per hour. That translates to a monthly income of only about a thousand U.S. dollars, far below the salary needed to meet the minimum cost of living for a family of four at fifteen hundred dollars. In the eurozone, Germany and the U.K. have moved to raise their minimum wage this year, and the minimum wage in many European countries is already double that of Seoul. In the U.S. and Japan. Large companies are raising salaries to stimulate consumption. Last month, Walmart announced that it will raise its hourly pay to nine U.S. dollars per hour, and Japanese automakers like Nissan, Toyota, and Honda have raised their base monthly salaries by 30 to 40 dollars, following a pickup in sales from the weekend. But that trend hasn't reached Seoul yet. Samsung Electronics, for example, has frozen salaries after a disappointing performance last year. Finance Minister Choi Kyung Hwan is calling on business leaders to raise salaries, but they claim wage hikes would weaken their price competitiveness, as many Korean companies rely heavily on exports. Experts suggest a wage hike could benefit the labor market, along with improved domestic sentiment. A wage hike could help boost salaries at the bottom of the bracket and could also encourage job creation. There should be room for drawing the extra funds from the cash reserves many conglomerates have accumulated so far. Although the government has scaled back, saying wage negotiation is a matter to be discussed between management and labor, a stronger push is needed from the government to convince large companies to initiate the move. Song ji Arirang News. U.S. tech giant Apple took the number one ranking in the Asian smartphone market in the fourth quarter of 2014. Apple's market share in Asia was 16 percent, logging 3 percent higher than Samsung, according to tech market research firm Counterpoint. Korea, Japan and China led demand for Apple's flagship iPhone 6 and 6 Plus models. Third and fourth place went to Chinese smartphone makers Xiaomi and Huawei. Apple also took the lead in North America, but emerging markets like South America, the Middle East and Africa showed a stronger preference toward Samsung for its price competitiveness. As with most tech gadgets entering the smart realm, surveillance cameras now have smart functions. CCTVs have always been able to record what's happening, but now some smart CCTVs can prevent accidents and even catch intruders. Kim ji shows us the technology. An employee starts to walk around with no safety mask or safety gear on. The potentially hazardous situation is detected by a state-of-the-art camera and instantly relayed to a safety administrator. The Smart Video Management System, or SVMS, developed by Samsung S1, has the ability to preemptively detect dangerous situations. We film a site for a month and find a pattern to determine unsafe conditions based on the camera's 14 algorithms. There are six more categories for various industries. The system can detect and send warning signs to the administrators, allowing a swift response. The SVMS uses a facial recognition program for intruders or to locate a particular person in a designated area. By calculating the speed and angle of movements, the system can detect violent acts or someone has lost consciousness. It can also figure out if barrels containing hazardous material are in danger of tipping over by calculating their angle. This system changes the dynamics of CCTVs, merely used for recording stuff that has already happened. It's also a major improvement as it cuts down on human error. Previously, an administrator had to monitor multiple screens at all times. And the success rate of detecting an accident drops by around half if a person monitors multiple screens for more than 10 minutes. The rate drops even more drastically after just 20 minutes. Due to this, the government is investing 6.3 million U.S. dollars over the next five years on these smart surveillance systems. And to address concerns about privacy, security companies have come up with features to protect identities of those caught on camera. Samsung S1 blurs the faces when they're filming and reveals them only when they're legally required to do so. 
There are an estimated 2.7 million CCTV cameras currently installed in Korea, including those managed by government agencies and those owned by individuals. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. The Islamic State militant group has claimed responsibility for Wednesday's massacre at Tunisia's National Museum. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, more than 20 people were killed in this shocking attack. How is IS linking itself to this act of violence? Well, in an audio message posted online Thursday, the extremist group based in Iraq and Syria purportedly said it was behind the targeted shooting. They even warned it was only the beginning of more attacks. That being said, evidence of any connection has been scarce. Some security analysts in the region are skeptical and wonder if IS is taking credit for the work of a sympathizer. Audience Kwan Sua has more. The first drop of rain is how the Islamic State extremist group described Wednesday's attack on a museum in Tunisia. Claiming responsibility in an audio recording posted on Twitter, the terror group praised the two attackers killed in the mission, calling them Knights of the Islamic State. The group, however, offered no proof that it was behind the attack. In their ongoing investigations, police have made nine arrests. Four suspects are said to be directly linked to the gunmen. The remaining five are alleged to be part of a terrorist cell. Officials say the terrorists chose Bardot Museum as its proud symbol of Tunisia's historical identity. They chose Bardot Museum and this is not a coincidence. Bardot Museum is a place of memory and they hate these memories. Bardot Museum is a place for history and they hate history. The overall death toll rose to 25 on Thursday, including 20 foreign tourists from several nations, a police officer and the two gunmen who were shot dead by security forces. Nearly 50 others were hurt. But Tunisia's security services have been praised for their quick response as the gunmen had explosives which they failed to detonate. Surveillance will be intensified on all tourist zones in the country to avoid any other incidents like the one yesterday. It will involve all the national territory. The attack is the deadliest to have hit Tunisia in more than a decade. The country is concerned about the impact this attack could have on its young democracy and its tourism industry, of which its economy is heavily dependent. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And in other news, President Barack Obama has sent a video message to the people of Iran calling on the seas, seas what they call the best chance in decades to improve ties with the U.S. He also focused on the Iranian nuclear talks, saying it could pave the way for a, quote, different relationship. Let's take a look. My message to you, the people of Iran, is that together we have to speak up for the future we seek. As I've said many times before, I believe that our countries should be able to resolve this issue peacefully with diplomacy. Obama sent the goodwill message on Thursday to mark celebrations of the Iranian New Year. He called on Iran's leaders to choose a path of reopening trade and investment with the rest of the world rather than keeping the country under the heavy weight of sanctions. The remarks come at the critical juncture as Iran and six world powers are aiming to reach a final deal on trans nuclear development by the end of June. And shifting now to Australia, it's been three months since the deadly siege at a cafe in Sydney, but today its doors have reopened to the public. Hundreds of customers lined up to pay their respects to the victims and show support in the heart of the city's business district. The Premier of New South Wales, Mike Barrett, said it was an important day for the people of Australia. It is our thoughts and prayers remain uh, with the victims, families and friends. This is a tough day for them, as every day is tough. Uh, but we continue to mourn with them uh, and together with all of those uh, who are injured, our thoughts remain with them as well. Uh, it's also an important day uh, for this city because actions that came to the cause hate and division actually brought peace and unity. The Lynn Chocolate Cafe displayed memorial plaques for the 34-year-old manager and 38-year-old mother of three who were killed in the final moments of the siege. The December incident has since prompted the Australian government to review stricter immigration and anti-terror laws. And finally, the online retail giant Amazon has gone the green light from the U.S. government to start testing its delivery drones. 
The Federal Aviation Administration announced on Thursday that it will allow the company to start flying drone prototypes over Washington State, but said routes will be limited to private rural areas. Design specs show the small unmanned aircraft will be able to fly up to 80 kilometers per hour. They'll even be able to operate autonomously by sensing and avoiding objects. Amazon says it hopes to build a fleet of robotic drones to quickly deliver packages to its customers. The ambitious service, however, is still raising public concerns over safety and privacy. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here next week. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Che with the Sports Brief. Tipping things off with the KBL playoffs, let's go to Ursan for Game 2 of the semifinal between the Mobus Phoebus and the embattled LG Sakers. Now many thought that the, it was the end for LG which released Davon Jefferson for his unprofessional behavior sparked by him stretching during the national anthem in Game 1, but clearly that was not the case. Chris Massey stepped up to fill the gap as LG took control early and went on to defeat Mobis, which shot a dismal 38% from within the arc. With the series tied 1-1, to -1, LG takes home court for Game 3 on Sunday. Over to the V-League, the playoffs kicked off with Game 1 of the three-game series between the IBK Altos and the Hyundai ENC Hill State. Now the Altos blasted off early, taking the set's lead into the fourth frame. Now the Hill State got the lead to start the epic set, only to lose the edge later on. Destiny led with 32 kills as the Altos got the win for the 1-0 series lead. Game 2 heads to Suwon on Sunday. Moving on to golf at the JTBC Founders Cup, world number one Lydia Go took the share of the lead in Phoenix after a rain-delayed opening round. Go, along with Tiffany Joe, Kim Kaufman and Sophia Popo were fantastic, scoring six under par to close out the round. They would avoid the rain and wet conditions that forced about half the field to pack up their clubs early. Meanwhile, the Koreans are in the hunt going into round two with Chun in -ji, a shot back, and Yang hee -young and two fellow nationals trailing by two. Finally, after much debate and deliberation, FIFA confirmed a Winter World Cup for Qatar in 2022, which will run from November to December. The World Football Governing Body's Executive Committee decided the World Cup final will be held on December 18th, Qatar's National Day celebrating their independence. They also agreed in principle to a 28-day schedule shortened from the usual 32. The time frame was ultimately chosen to avoid the blistering summer heat and not to clash with the 2022 Winter Olympics the following month. And that's all I have for sports this week. Your weather's up next. Good night. Hello and good evening. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. Spring like conditions continue today, but unfortunately, micro dust rose to higher than normal levels. And at the moment, Seoul is getting 111 micrograms per cubic meter, which is about two to three times the average. And at the moment, clouds are moving in over the central regions, but it's mostly clear skies down south. So, aside from the air quality issues, tomorrow is shaping up to be another fabulous day. Nice for outdoor activities. So I wish to start off the morning at 6 Busan at 10 before daytime highs jump to the high teens. Enjoy the weather while you can because a cold front is set to arrive by late Sunday, causing morning lows on Monday and Tuesday to drop below zero degrees. On to Saturday's readings. Seoul and Busan should reach a high of 19, Daegu and Gwangju the 20s. Moving on to other regions, Jeju peaks at 17, Bokdo hits 12, Mount Kumgang reaches 8. Those are the updates we're following at this hour. Have a wonderful Friday evening.
And that's primetime news for this Friday. Happy Friday. I'm Kang Tidi. Thanks for watching. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.